first successful full-scale flight in 1903. Had the first successful flight been achieved with a rotary-winged helicopter, the history of flight might have been different. The achievement of all others and established the fixed-wing aircraft. But the moving wing still had its advocates. For the first 30 years of the century, they went on trying to make machines which would rise vertically into the air. particularly difficult. First, the rotation of the blades tends to make the body of the machine turn in the opposite direction. This can be counteracted either by a small vertical tail rotor driven by the same engine as the main rotor or by two sets of main rotors revolving in opposite directions. Secondly, when the machine moves forward, one blade of the rotor is moving with the airflow while another is moving against it. The airspeed of a blade increases as it turns towards the nose. This produces unequal lift and therefore instability. The answer to this problem was to hinge the blades so that they could flat and could also speed up or slow down relative to each other. Juan de la Sierra discovered this and so managed to smooth out much of the irregularity of lift. 
This solved another problem. As the blades of the rotor are no longer rigidly fixed, they are held in position only by centrifugal force. The whole structure is therefore relieved of a great deal of strain. The Sierra aircraft, like this C-19, all use this principle of the flapping blades. But they were not helicopters. They were autogyros. In an autogyro, the propeller produces forward motion, and the rotor is turned by the aerodynamic forces acting on it, and not by the engine. The autogyro was in fact an aeroplane on which the wings were replaced by a rotor. The ordinary autogyro could not take off vertically, although its takeoff run was very short. In later years, vertical takeoff was achieved in the autogyro by coupling the engine to the rotor. This principle could be used only for the takeoff. Meanwhile, work on helicopters went on. In 1930, Florine showed his machine with the new flapping blade to the public at the Brussels exhibition. In the same year, Descanio established the first world helicopter record with a flight of eight and three quarter minutes, covering 1,000 yards at a height of 59 feet. He reached a speed of about 15 miles per hour. Six years later, in 1936, the Pioneer Breguet came to the front with a much improved design in which the problems of control were tackled with considerable success. Records were established for this machine. Duration, 63 minutes. Altitude, 515 feet. Distance, 27 and one half miles at a speed of 62 miles per hour. Breguet used what is today known as cyclic pitch control. This means that the angle at which a rotor blade meets the air is altered as the blade rotates with the hub. By photographing the blades in slow motion, they can be seen to rise and fall with the influence of the airflow and centrifugal forces. When the aircraft is taking off, the pilot holds the stick roughly central and the lift force is acting vertically. The pilot moves the stick forward. The advancing blade, furthest from the camera, decreases in pitch and flaps downwards. The retreat blade, nearest the camera, increases in pitch and flaps upwards. In effect, the rotor is tilted forward. It thus becomes the means of accelerating the aircraft forward as well as the means of supporting it in the air. The pilot decides to turn to the right. Stick right. The blade on the left flaps up. The blade on the right flaps down. The aircraft goes into a right-hand turn. In 1937, the first really successful helicopter, the Fokker Achgelis, was announced. The flexibility and control of this machine were demonstrated when Hannah Wright flew it inside the Berlin Sports Stadium. Then another of the pioneers, Igor Sikorsky, who had been working on helicopter design from the beginning of the century, achieved success in America. All these discoveries helped to produce the helicopter as we know it today. It's still curious to look at, but it can fly in a way even surpassing the flight of birds. It takes off and lands, hovers in the air, and even turns a full circle over the same spot. Helicopter design is constantly progressing. The precision of control is something of which Dascanio could only have dreamed. The British Bristol 171, a single rotor type, carries three passengers as well as the pilot. In contrast to the sleek lines of the Bristol is the angular body of the giant air horse. 
produced by the Pioneer Company, started by the late Juan de la Sierra. The engine used in this helicopter is so powerful that the three rotors can lift a total weight of just over eight tons. This enormous capacity at last fills a gap between the usual helicopters with their limited loads and the airplane. At the other end of this scale, the Sierra Company has produced a small sister to the Air Horse, a neat-looking two-seat personal helicopter called the Skeeter. The Ferry Company's Gyrodyne is one of the world's fastest helicopters. Here we see it traveling at 124.3 miles per hour. The Gyrodyne uses an offset propeller to counteract the torque reaction of the main rotor. This has the added advantage that the propeller gives additional thrust to drive the aircraft. In France, Louis Braguet, one of the leaders of helicopter technique, designed this three-seater using superimposed contra-rotating rotors. A development of the pre-war German Fokker Aggelis, keeping the original rotor configuration, has been made by Sudest and is designed to carry six people. Another French company, Sud West, have developed an experimental helicopter with a rotor driven by jets at the blade tips. One of the attractions of the jet-driven helicopter is that as the driving force is at the tips of the blades, there is no torque reaction to correct, and tail rotors and such devices are not needed. Jet-driven rotors have also been developed in America. This experimental single-seater, built by the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, is called Little Henry. The no-hands flying of this Hiller Hornet demonstrates well the great stability of helicopters employing jet-driven rotors. Helicopter types and designs are unending. The silhouette of the Sikorsky S-51, one of the first helicopters to go into large-scale production, is familiar throughout the world. It flew the first certificated U.S. helicopter airmail route, speeding airmail from the Los Angeles airport to the downtown post office and on to adjacent communities. The Sikorsky, now being built in England by Westland, has been used for experiments in carrying mail by night, flying blind between two large towns. These services portend the day when large helicopters like this Sikorsky S-55 and the Bell HH-12 will be in regular service, carrying mail, passengers and cargo between nearby cities and surrounding suburban areas. Smaller Bell helicopters are now being used on the land with great success, spraying crops and cattle, dusting orchards where the downwash from the rotors directs insecticide over and under the leaves. Rotor downwash is also used for a strange form of harvesting. It's a simple way of gathering walnuts which can't be damaged by their forceful descent. The helicopter is serving in the expansion of our vital oil reserves, transporting exploration parties swiftly and economically to hard-to-reach locations. In addition, it can also serve as a work platform for precise geological readings. The military helicopter, the Piaseki or Flying Banana, is like something out of a story by Jules Verne or H.G. Wells. The Command, a military trainer, employs twin intermeshing rotors. These eliminate the necessity of a tail rotor. For emergency rescue, the helicopter is unrivaled. It can transport the injured to a hospital or the stranded to safety, whether the scene of emergency is battle-torn terrain or the expanse of a storm-swept sea. Admiral 
took Halleck's 1946 Antarctic expedition for surveys more detailed than could be undertaken by a conventional aircraft. A good example of a small helicopter with an all-around view is the Hiller 360 with its Perspex bubble front. It is excellent for police control of traffic, aerial inspections, and similar work. The helicopter has provided new vantage points for the tourists. There is no better way of seeing the Grand Canyon. For herding cattle or elk, there is the comfort of a helicopter with its large field of vision and its ability to fly slowly. The helicopter has been used to do work that seemed impossible. Here, it speeds construction materials high up into the Welsh mountains to repair a dam. Yes, the helicopter has arrived. Prehistoric to look at, but so versatile that it fills an important gap in transport. Rotary wing flight is now a reality. The helicopter is part of a fantastic future in which you and I may fly about in our own private aircraft. But we must not be led astray by a dream. The helicopter will not supplant the car or the airplane but as chemists and engineers continue their unending search for better fuels and lubricants for flight, for lighter and more powerful gasoline engines, for more efficient jet engines, and for improved airframe designs, the helicopter will enable us to fly with a freedom we've never had before.